Welcome Solid Source. We are going to take a look at the RE100 contract for the purchase and sale of residential real property. So this is the contract that is available to all MLS members. Within FMLS, Docs Plus, or within the Georgia MLS Transaction Desk, everyone has access to the RE100. Now, this is a definitely not the most preferred contract. Full disclaimer, the Georgia Association of Realtors Purchase and Sale Agreement is the leading contract here in the state of Georgia. If you are a board member, you already have access to the GAR forms through your board membership. If you're a non-board member, you can certainly purchase a license to use the forms at forms.garealtor.com. However, maybe you're a board member, maybe you're a non-board member, you've purchased a license. It's still a good idea to be familiar with the RE100 because chances are you will encounter this form at some point in your real estate career and it's very good to understand how to complete the form and what some of the key differences are between the RE100 and the GAR contract form. So with the RE contract this is a five page agreement so the blanks to be completed are, are going to be scattered throughout this form and a lot of the terms, the bulk of the terms, are actually incorporated by reference. And those are going to be available online at reformsga.com. When the parties sign the contract, they're acknowledging that they have visited this website and that they are familiar with the terms. So one key difference right off the bat is all of the terms aren't contained within the five-page agreement. A lot of those terms are going to be online. But similarly to other contracts, we start off with the offer date. And this is simply going to be the date that the offer is being made, typically the same day we're sending this over to the buyer to sign, typically also the same day it's presented to the listing agent. So we're simply going to fill in the offer date, just a reference point. Now the RE contract asks us to identify the names of the buyers and the sellers on the first page of the contract. Now, I've gone ahead and just filled in some examples, buyer Bob, seller Sam, but it does call for us to identify the parties right off the bat. Now, moving beyond the terms which are available online, we move into the bulk of the contract with the very first section being the property description. Here we do want to fill in the commonly known mailing address, the property address, but we have a couple of options to incorporate that legal description. So you've probably heard us mention in some other videos how important that legal description is from a Georgia Real Estate Commission rules and regulations standpoint, as well as just from an enforceability standpoint, we want to make sure our contracts specifically identify the property. Now the easiest way to do that is to reference the deed book and the page number. I will link uh, this video in the description below to a separate video where we walk through how to locate the deed book and page number, but that's going to be what most, what we most oftentimes are going to recommend even using the RE contract. Now you still have the option to attach a copy of the legal, which is usually a deed to the property, and you certainly can, can select this last option here, but if you're going to select this, make sure we at least know the plat book and the page number, as well as as much additional information as possible in these other fields. Now in section two, this is simply going to be the purchase price of the property. For an example's sake, let's just say our purchase price is going to be $275. Now when we fill in, and I will just make a small correction there, when we fill in the numbers in the blank here, it is going to automatically populate the words in the preceding blank. So, for example, I filled in 275000 numerically. It went ahead and wrote in the words $275,000. So, making that process very simple. Earnest money, same thing. I'm going to fill in that our earnest money, just for an example, is $3,000 because we identified the amount. If I click outside that box, it's going to go ahead and populate the words $3,000. Now, we do identify the holder. Again, increasingly common for closing attorneys to serve as the earnest money holder. If you are a solid source agent and you're watching this video and you prefer 
for Solid Source to hold the funds. Just name Solid Source Realty. We do use Solid Source Realty to hold earnest money funds for both of our Solid Source companies. We do identify the form of the earnest money. Now, it gives us a handful of, a handful of options here. Notice ACH is not one of them. One of the changes GAR made to their contracts this past year was they added ACH as an option. It's not an option yet in the RE contract. So we could absolutely specify within special stipulations that the earnest money will be remitted in the form of an ACH transfer at WeissmanEM.com if the buyer, for example, is going to remit the funds on their earnest money website. Maybe Solid Source Realty is the holder and the buyer wants to remit those funds at SolidSourceEM.com we can simply specify that in special stipulations. For example, today we'll say it's going to be a check and we'll go ahead and mark that option. And what is going to be the time frame? 3.1, really important. What is going to be the time frame for the earnest money to be remitted to the holder? I never recommend this first option unless the money has truly already been delivered, but most buyers would prefer to deliver the earnest money within a certain number of days from the binding date or the acceptance date. RE contracts do not use the term binding agreement date. They call it acceptance date. So another key difference in these forms. And two to three days is a standard time frame from the date of acceptance for the earnest money to be delivered to the holder. Closing in section four. So we're simply going to reference the date that the closing is going to take place. So I'm just going to randomly pick a date about a month in the future, we do specify which office. Let's just say that Weissman is going to be the closing attorney uh, in this particular transaction. It does prompt us to identify the location. Most, well, I won't say most, but a lot of closing attorneys have multiple locations. And so in this case, let's just say that the parties wish to close in the Alpharetta office. So I will simply reference Alpharetta, Georgia. Now it does go on to ask if the closing attorney is not available or is unacceptable to the buyer's lender. Because keep in mind, the, the lender is who the attorney actually represents at the closing when there is a loan. It's not the buyer or the seller. We can specify which party, buyer or seller, has a right to pick a different closing attorney. I absolutely recommend buyer. And I do recommend possession be at closing. We don't recommend a buyer take possession early. What if the property doesn't close or a seller stay in a property after closing? Our obligations, our ability to really jump in and help the parties is going to end at closing. Once a deal closes, it's closed. If an individual, a seller, does not vacate the property, it's an issue that the buyer and seller are left to, to deal with. So if, if we can ever give possession at closing, that's what we're going to recommend in almost every case. If possession can't be at closing, let's say a buyer is moving in early, a seller is going to stay after, make sure we use that occupancy agreement. We attach it. It prompts us in big, bold letters to do that here because that occupancy agreement is the, it gives the parties as much protection as we possibly can. So really important to include that if applicable. Number five, we are going to identify how much closing costs the seller is going to contribute toward the buyer's closing costs. In a very competitive seller's market, you all may know this, but we're seeing zero. But if the buyer is asking for a specific amount, maybe the buyer is asking for a percentage of the purchase price, we can simply express that here. The next section, and I know we're moving quick, but the next section is very important, and that's the contingencies. So buyer's general right to terminate, the appraisal contingency, the financing contingency, these are baked into the RE contract. So Unless this is an FHA, a VA, or a USDA loan, we can simply use the financing contingency built into the agreement. In other words, if it's conventional, we don't have to attach anything separately. But one significant difference is due diligence is called right to terminate. So the due diligence period is the right to terminate, and that's where we're simply going to fill in that number of days that uh, the buyer has to, to do their homework and to worst case, terminate the agreement without penalty if they do not choose to move forward. 
Appraisal and financing contingencies tend to work hand in hand. Always a good idea to check with the lender and see how much time they actually need to get this done. I know that in a very competitive market, it's going to scoot this back over, a very competitive market, some buyers are able to pay for a rush appraisal and get things done in 14 days or so. Uh, perhaps the buyer's already been pre-approved. They've already gone through the pre-approval process. They might be able to to afford a shorter financing contingency period. So those are just things to keep in mind in a competitive market as well. Now, in our example, we're going to say that this is a conventional loan and we're asking for 21 days. This section here below 6.3 is where we're going to fill in the details of the buyer's loan. And remember, the amount of the loan, the interest rate, and the term, those are what we refer to as the big three when it comes to financing. So we want to make sure that the financing contingency, whether that be on a separate document or conventional baked into the RE contract, we include the amount of the loan, the interest rate, and the term, the number of years, typically going to be 30 or 15. Most oftentimes there's not a second mortgage loan, uh, but there could be, and if there is, we would certainly fill that section out as well. Moving on to section seven, inspection of the property. Now this can be very confusing, especially if an agent is using the RE contract for the first time, because it asks us to select an acceptable time frame. So nine to seven is when most home inspectors would be accessing the property. And in most cases, that's going to work. If for whatever reason we're dealing with a unique situation, we can certainly specify a different time frame. But in most every case, nine to seven is a perfectly acceptable time frame. Go ahead and select that box. I do recommend that we select the seller will make the utilities operational and that we don't leave this blank. If we don't leave it blank, there could be room for some issues down the road, especially if the seller doesn't have the utilities connected or they've disconnected them, really want to make sure we make a selection here and I recommend the seller. Now we're moving on now to section eight, which is brokerage. So this is where we disclose the brokerage relationships, whether a party is a customer or a client. We don't offer dual agency. So if you're a solid source agent and you're watching this video, we don't practice dual. So you'll never check that one. And you also have designated. What is designated agency? It means both the buyer and the seller are with the same exact brokerage firm and both of those agents have a client relationship, a written brokerage engagement with the party that they're working with. Let's say in our example today that the buyer is a client because we've already signed an exclusive buyer brokerage agreement with the buyer. And let's just say the seller is a for sale by owner. I'm going to mark the second box for sale by owner. I had the seller sign an authorization to show enlisted property, or if you're using RE forms, RE forms package agreement to show property without a listing, I'm going to check that second box that the seller is a customer. Now, I don't have any material relationships to disclose in this particular example today, but let's just say that the buyer held a real estate license and I needed to disclose that, or there was a relationship that was considered material. This is the perfect space to go ahead and make that disclosure. Section 8.4 is only related to designated agency. I do see this as a common mistake when completing the RE contract. Agents will go ahead and, and, pot and fill in the name of the agents here, but 8.4 should only be filled in if this is designated agency. And on page nine exhibits, any exhibits to the contract we're simply going to reference here and any special stipulations we will go ahead and reference here. And then finally on page five, this is going to be the signature page. So we have an opportunity to express a time limit of the offer, reasonable time limit, two to three days, generally going to be a good idea. And then once the offer is actually accepted and hopefully it will be fingers crossed that we become binding, this will be where we fill in the binding agreement date. So the order is a little bit unusual here because the acceptance or binding date is actually before the signature blocks. Just another difference in just the way the forms are simply set up. But essentially, we're going to have the printed name of the buyer and seller, their signatures, 
If a party is not represented, let's say, again, Seller Sam is a for sale by owner, I will want to go ahead and include his contact information here because there won't be another agent. We will be the only agent involved. Notice to us won't be noticed to Sam like it would if Sam were a client, which is why under the buyer, I'm not going to include the buyer's contact information. No specific right or wrong here, but as a general rule of thumb, if a buyer or seller is a client, we don't include their contact information, and if they are a customer, we do. And underneath the buyer and seller's broker, simply going to disclose the name of the brokerage firms, the firm's contact information and license number, and the agent's name, contact information, and license number. And if the property does happen to be listed in the MLS, go ahead and include that MLS listing number there. And on the bottom of each page, you're going to see a section for the buyer and seller to initial. Go ahead and ask them to initial. Most of us are going to be sending this document out for signature through the eSign platform in Docs Plus or perhaps the transaction desk. And those fields will be there. The buyer and seller will be prompted for those. And we hope that this tutorial helps. I know we went through this rather quickly. Pretty simple agreement, five pages. Blanks are going to be scattered throughout, but the way that the agreement uses terminology, as in right to terminate being due diligence, and in the financing and appraisal being built into the contract, unless it's FHA or VA or USDA, in those cases we will want to include absolutely those financing exhibits. And perhaps the most important difference from a practical standpoint between the RE and the GAR, and I definitely don't want to leave this out, is the eight-day unilateral right to extend the closing date. There is no eight-day unilateral right to extend the closing date in the RE contract unless we were to add it as a special stipulation. I will go ahead and include as a bonus in the description below a special stipulation that you can use if you're using the RE contract to include that eight-day extension.